<clears throat> Our scripture reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 1 through 18. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured, have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pure pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. But the word of truth, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the honor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and, and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is in heart. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straight, straightened in your own mouths. Now for recompense of the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, yet what, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what comfort hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be, and be separate. And saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Let me mention that in, in regard to Reformation, we know that there was a period of time when Reformation took place in the various uh, countries of, of Europe and, uh, and it spread across the continent and uh, the Lord worked in a mighty way during that time and it's an exciting time in church history uh, to read about those who were faithful to God's holy and infallible word and who sought to advance the kingdom and who sought uh, a purity in the church and uh, and, they, and they would have practiced what we term separation. We're called on the scripture as the evening question says here, wherefore come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. We simply say, for Churches that are supposed to be churches, uh, they're supposed to adhere to God's holy and fallible word. And yet, in many, many circles today, uh, not only in our country, but throughout the world, there are those who have, uh, who would be known as apostates. That word means to fall from the faith. <coughs> so they've fallen from the faith, and, uh, and they're, uh, they deny God's uh, infallible word, they deny that Jesus is the only way of salvation. They, that all sorts of truths that they deny 
and have nothing to do with, and people ought to separate from them. Well, that was the part of the history of the Bible Presbyterian Church. The men, the pastors, and elders, and church members uh, across the country uh, started a, a movement to start another Presbyterian denomination, and that was the Bible Presbyterian Church. And uh, these men, especially Dr. Carl McIntyre, was a leader, and he was faithful. And we're thankful for how God used him in such a mighty way. We rejoice in that. But there were those who opposed the ones who said we had to separate. And everyone wanted to go along to get along. Well, that's silly. I didn't find that verse in the Bible anywhere. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, and, and so that's, that's what took place. And it was a great movement. And just a, a little background here is that at the time this church had gotten started, uh, Dr. McIntyre was on the radio five days a week and had about 600 stations. So his word was really getting all over the country. And here in Little Kalispell, before the difference that we have right now, but he broadcast, I forgot where it was, where the antenna or whatever it was, but anyway, it was uh, carried here five days a week. And, and the Lord used it to bring people together that were in an apostate Presbyterian church. And that's the one on Main Street. But they were in an apostate uh, Presbyterian church. And they, they left. And uh, what was interesting is that the man who was the minister was an elderly man and there at the First Presbyterian. And he, uh, he helped the people that were starting this church get in contact with Dr. McIntyre. He helped him do it. And, and he was about to retire but he was holding out to the end when he would qualify. They had a retirement program, so he was holding out until that. But, and he, he told them who they needed to talk to. He helped find out how to get a hold of him and so on. And, and, and asking Dr. McIntyre to do something like that, he would love to do it. He, you know, I'm, I'm sure he had a lot of requests during that period of time because there was church after church after church. They was leaving the apostate church and becoming Bible Presbyterian. And that's a part of the Reformation, you know, and we built on the Reformation and, and the example of others, and, and we celebrate Reformation Day here. And, uh, but anyway, it was just a, I always thought it was an easy thing. That, that elderly man uh, was quite cordial, and, uh, and the people really loved him. He, he was good. And, uh, and so, um, but anyway, the Lord used it in his providence, and so we're thankful for that. And, and those stories similar to that can be uh, spoken of across the country. And then as the work of the Independent Board for Presbyterian Farm Missions took hold and spread throughout the world, you know, it, uh, Dr. McIntyre's church was especially a missionary church. And uh, they were very, very, very strong on missions. And the apostasy, uh, primarily when it began to uh, show itself in the old Northern Presbyterian Church, it, it was in the mission field. And, uh, and what happened is that there was a, a, some missionaries who said, and they were where false religions are being taught. And so their, their mission board, not anything to do with the independent board at all, but anyway, their mission boards told their missionaries, we go ahead and worship with these people in, in, in their religion, and they'll think, they'll, they'll accept you better if you do that. So, you know, uh, get down on your knees with them, what, whatever. And, uh, but that's what they did. And, uh, and eventually, um, the, uh, the ministers that started that uh, mission agency, they were charged with, uh, of, of all things, they were charged with going against the denomination. Well, amen, praise the Lord, that they did that. And, uh, and 
and they eventually then were, were thrown out. They had started a reformation, not of the liking of those who were in charge of the Northern Presbyterian Church. And these various men were put on trial. They, they were charged, uh, I don't know how you say it, you know, do you, I charge you with preaching the Word of God. You know, that sounds pretty good. But they wouldn't have thought of that. And uh, anyway, and a, and a number of men, including Dr. McIntyre, was thrown out of the Northern Presbyterian Church and immediately started, you know, the Bible Presbyterian Church. But what happened is that in his church, they had a beautiful, beautiful building in Collinswood, New Jersey. And it was really, really a, a great place. A lot of people there. And, and so they knew that they were going to have to leave uh, because he got thrown out. And uh, so they had set up a tent that was several blocks away and, uh, and set up chairs and so on. And, and the, the thing that, that they did on the last service that they were in there, original building, they had to have a, a, a circle around the pulpit to keep people from the presbytery coming in and causing trouble. And they wanted to protect their pulpit Bible. And they, they took their pulpit Bible with them. I don't know if it was as big as this one. It might have taken a couple of men to get that. But anyway, um, and that's what happened. And that was all a reformation. Things were changed, and, and there was a return to the Word of God. And so we, on this day, on Reformation Sunday, we certainly think of those like Mark Luther, who came and stood faithful to God, or John Calvin, and, and there's a whole lot of them. And um, you really ought to get Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's outstanding. They're short stories. And so it's not like you're going to get bogged down in a 20 or 30 page chapter, anything like that. I mean, it's, uh, they're, they're wonderful stories. Pe it cost people. I still remember the story about the two faithful women who were taken out and posts were driven into the sand at the beach at low tide. And they tied the women to those posts and high tide came in and they died. And they died. They died for their faith. Or there's the story about one woman who was at a church where this uh, liberal guy was ministering. Only this woman was faithful and she uh, she picked up a stool three-legged stool and threw it at the guy <laughs> while it was preaching. And that stool became a, certainly a memoir that people had retained for some time. And I remember one right now, said, you know, I'm not sure where it is, probably in, in the Collinswood area, but you can go and you can see the stool <laughs> this lady threw at the guy. And uh, so, but there's all sorts of interesting stories like that. But we need Reformation, and we rejoice that we were a part of the 20th century Reformation movement and that we uh, helped to advance the cause of Christ. And we also, by the grace of God, we spoke out against the wickedness in these apostate churches. Now, there'll be, uh, there's a lot of people who say, oh, we agree with you, pat you on the back, and never want to see them again. And, uh, and so, uh, but they were faithful, they were men of God, and uh, they were raised up. Uh, missionary work was outstanding with them, and missionaries, whether it's Korea or wherever, and spread, spread all around the world uh, from this little, little group. And uh, we think even, as we said, about how this church started they kept, they heard Dr. McIntyre every day. And uh, and I don't know if they went in and asked the pastor about what this, this Dr. McIntyre's talking about. He said, oh, I can put you in touch with him. And uh, 
So we're thankful for that. But we realize that there's a, a great need for this. I want to share with you some of what's given about Martin Luther. We think of when, when he uh, was called before the, uh, the kings of, of all Europe, the kings from all the countries. They were political powers. They were church powers. They gathered to bring charges against him for false preaching. And he basically told them. And he had he had all his books. He must have had a big table. Anyway, he had all his books out in front of him that he had written. He said, you show me one error in there that's contrary to scripture and I'll take it out. He said, we'll come back tomorrow. So they came back the next day and they didn't find one. And, and, and the kings of the earth were sitting in judgment on him. The, the big wigs in the, in the church, in the apostate church, were uh, coming to get rid of him. And we read part of what he said when this occasion had, had took place. He said, O oh, Almighty and everlasting God, how terrible is this world. Behold, it openeth its mouth to swallow me up. I have so little trust in it, and I have so little trust in thee. How weak is the flesh, and how powerful is Satan. If it is in the strength of this world only, that I must put my trust, all is over. My last hour has come. My condemnation has been pronounced. O oh God, O oh God, O oh God, do thou help me against all the wisdom of the world. Do this, thou, sh thou shouldest do this, thou alone. This is not my word, but thine. I have nothing to do here, nothing to contend for with these great ones of the world. I should desire to see my days flow on peaceful and happy, but the cause is thine. And this was an important phrase that marked Martin Luther when he said, but the cause is thine. It was the cause of those men that came out of Collinswood. It was the cause of those people who helped to start the churches across the land, and uh, and we rejoice in this. And he went on, that the cause is thine, and it is a righteous and eternal cause. O oh Lord, help me, faithful and unchangeable God, in no man do I place my trust. It would be vain. All that is of man is uncertain. All that cometh of man fails. O oh God, my God, hearest thou me not? My God, art thou dead? No, thou canst not die. Thou hidest thyself only. Thou hast chosen me for this work. I know it well. Act then, O oh God, stand at my side for the sake of thy well-beloved Jesus Christ, who is my defense, my shield, in my strong tower. After a, a moment of silent struggle, he continued, Lord, where, where stayest thou? Oh my God, where art thou? Come, come, I am ready. I am ready to lay down my life for thy truth, patient as a lamb, for it is the cause of justice. It is thine. I will never separate myself from thee, neither now nor through eternity. And though the world should be filled with devils, though my body, which is still the work of thy hands, should be slain, be stretched upon the pavement, be cut in pieces, reduced to ashes, my soul is thine. Yes, I have the assurance of thy word my soul belongs to thee. It shall abide forever with thee. Amen. Will God help me? Amen.
this prayer explains Luther and the Reformation. History here raises the veil of the sanctuary and discloses to our view the secret place whence strength and courage were imparted to this humble and despised man who was the instrument of God to emancipate the soul and the thoughts of men and to open the new era. Luther and the Reformation are here brought before us. We discover their most secret springs. We see whence their power was derived. This outpouring of a soul that offers up itself in the cause of truth is to be found in the collection of documents relative to Luther's appearance at the Diet of Worms. In the midst of safe conducts and, and other papers of a similar nature, one of his friends had no doubt overheard it and has transmitted it to posterity. In our opinion, it is one of the most precious documents in all of history. After he thus prayed, Luther, Luther found that peace of mind without which man can affect nothing great. He then read the Word of God, looked over his writings, and sought to draw up his reply in a suitable form. The thought that he was about to bear testimony to Jesus Christ and his word in the presence of the emperor and of the empire filled his heart with joy. As the hour for his appearance was not far off, he drew near the holy scriptures that lay upon his table and with emotion placed his left hand on the sacred volume and raising his right hand towards heaven swore to remain faithful to the testimony to the gospel and freely to confess his faith even should he seal his testimony with his blood after this he felt still even more at peace at four o'clock the herald appeared and conducted him to the place where the it's called the diet it was an assembly where the diet was sitting the curiosity of the people had increased for the answer was to be decisive and the diet was occupied luther was compelled to wait in the court in the midst of an immense crowd which heaved to and fro like the sea in a storm and pressed the reformer with its waves two long hours elapsed while the doctor stood in this multitude so eager to catch a glimpse of him i was not accustomed said he to those manners and to all this noise it should have been a sad preparation indeed for an ordinary man but god was with luther his countenance was serene his features trans me, his features tranquil the everlasting one had raised him on a rock. The night began. To, the night began to fall. Torches were lighted in the hall of the assembly. Their glimmering rays shone through the ancient windows into the court. Everything assumed a solemn aspect. At last, Doctor Luther was introduced. Many persons entered with him, for everyone desired to hear the answer. Man's minds were on the stretch. All patiently awaited the moment that was approaching. This time Luther was calm. He was free and confident without the least perceptible mark of embarrassment. His prayer had borne fruit. The princes having taken their seats, though not without some difficulty for many of their places had been occupied and the monk of Wittenberg finding himself again standing before Charles V, the Chancellor of the Elector of the Elector Trees began by saying, Martin Luther, 
you begged yesterday, you begged for delay that has now expired. Assuredly, it ought not to have been conceded as every man, and especially you, you are so great and learned a doctor in the Holy Scriptures, should always be ready to answer every question touching his faith. Now, therefore, reply to the question put by this, by his majesty, who has behaved to you with so much mildness. Will you defend your books as a whole, or are you ready to disavow some of them? And having said these words in Latin, the Chancellor repeated them in German. Upon this, Dr. Martin Luther, say the active words, replied in the most submissive and humble manner. He did not fall or speak with violence, but with decency, mildness, suitability, and moderation, and yet with much joy and Christian fitness. My serene emperor, illustrious princes, Precious lords, and Luther turning his eyes on Charles and on the assembly, I appear before you this day in conformity with the order given me yesterday. And by God's mercies, I continue, I conjure your majesty and your august highness, highnesses to listen graciously to the defense of a cause which I am, which I am Sure, it's just and true. If through ignorance I should transgress the usages and properties of the court, I, I entreat you to pardon me. For I was not brought up in the palace of kings, but in the seclusion of a convent. Yesterday, two questions were put to me on behalf of the imperial majesty. The first, if I was the author of the books whose titles were enumerated, the second, if I would retract or defend the doctrine I had taught in them, the first I made answer, and I proceed in that reply. As for the second, I've written works on many different subjects. There are some in which I have treated of faith and good works in a manner at once so pure, so simple, so scriptural, that even my adversaries, far from finding anything to censure in them, allow that these works are useful and worthy of being read by all pious men. The papal bull, however violent it may be, acknowledges this. If therefore I work to retract these, what shall I do? Wretched man, among all men, I alone should abandon truths that friends and enemies approve, and I should oppose that the whole world glories in confessing. He went on to say, here. He said, after several words, yet I am but a mere man and not God. Thou shall not therefore defend myself as Christ did. If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, said he. How much more should I who am but dust and ashes, and who may so easily go astray, desire every man to state his objections to my doctrine? <coughs> he challenged him. On the word of God. What reply did they give that was from the Word of God in order to try to defend their position? These are the type of men that this world lacks these days. I don't know any Martin Luther's today. There are those who are faithful to God's word and who will maintain it, who will preach it, and in the face of opposition, in opposition, most likely will come. They hold firm. 
we need a firmness in our message. The whole counsel of God needs to be preached. There can't be any, any giving in to the unfruitful works of darkness. But it has to be, as in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, come out from among them to be separate and touch not the unclean thing. Amen. Our Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the life of Martin Luther. We're thankful for the lives of so many of the reformers, in, whether in England or Scotland or France or Germany or, or where, wherever it was, especially in, in Europe in this, and as their struggle spread. We rejoice in these faithful men of God. May we have faithful men of God today who won't be weary of well-doing, who will proclaim the whole counsel of God for the advancement of Christ's kingdom. For in his name we pray. Amen. <laughs>